broadcasting from Woodstock, Georgia, welcome to Soul Solutions, a show where we overcome our fears and our limiting beliefs. I'm your host, author, and certified life coach, Terry Kozlowski. Hello, this is a special edition of Soul Solutions called Ask Terry. So we've gathered some questions from you listeners, and we'll be, I'll be answering them today. I- I have a special guest all the way from Afghanistan, my son, Joshua. He will be asking the questions for us today. Welcome, Josh. Hi, hi, everyone. So why don't we go ahead and get started? All right. We have a couple questions here. Uh, Let's start with the very first one. How can I tame my monkey mind and calm my thinking? Monkey mind is a Buddhist term that refers to the constant chatter in our heads. So to tame the monkey mind and calm our thinking, one of the things that we have to do is we have to get into the present moment because the monkey mind is something that happens with the past and happens about the future. So the typical chatter that goes on in our heads are things like the laundry list of to-do items that seems never ending, the listing of the fears that we have, both real and imagined, those things that we just keep replaying in our heads, recalling the hurtful things that have happened in the past and those things that we don't want to continue to happen in the present. So we're judging the present. And of course, there's the creating of the catastrophic what if scenarios about the future. I was really good at those. I could take those situations and figure out all different scenarios and the likelihood that any one of them could ever occur was slim to none. So the monkey mind plays in the past and plays in the future. So to get into the present moment and to calm our thinking down, there's a breathing exercise that we can do. It's a simple exercise where you are going to take a deep breath to the count of five, hold for the count of five, and breathe out for the count of five. So we're going to take a deep breath. Three, four, five, hold. Three, four, five, and release three, four, five. Now, if you do that three times in a row, your body automatically goes into a automatic response where it actually calms the autonomic nervous system and allows you to decrease your blood pressure, decrease your pulse rate, and establish a normal breathing rhythm. So there actually is a physical response when you do that breathing exercise and it brings your mind and your body into the present moment where you are peaceful and calm and relaxed. And it's something that anybody can do anywhere, anytime. If you're in the office and your boss is ranting and raving, you don't have to close your eyes to do it, but you can just go ahead and take that deep breath and do it three times and you will calm down despite what's happening around you. Does that make sense? Of course. Uh, Next question here we have, how do I stop my mind from replaying the past in my head? The replaying of the past is similar to monkey mind, except that the egoic mind uses this as a way to keep us um, from doing anything, to keep us from moving forward. So it uses the historical data to determine our present course of action. But the ego only uses data that is skewed. And what I mean by that is it only looks at the negative. It, for some reason, doesn't at all remember how last week we had some good things that happened. It only remembers what happened in the past that was negative. So whether it happened 10 years ago or five years ago, and we've had many successes in the past three years, it focuses on the past negativity to reverse the replay, and we need to reframe the perception of the past. What I mean by that is that we have to change our viewpoint of whether something was negative or positive in our heads. And to do that, it's called reframing. It's a tool that we use to change the language that we have when we tell the stories about our lives. So for example, I am a a victim of childhood trauma And to be a victim means that you have a victim mentality and there are certain things that occur with that negative mindset. So I was harmed at the age of 11. And when I was about 19 and in college, I had somebody tell me that I enjoyed being the victim. Now, 
that sounds very harsh. And he wasn't trying to be harsh. Mm -hmm. He was trying to get me to see something, which was that there was something about being a a victim, playing the victim that I liked. And I may not have liked the trauma. I may not be pleased with the events that occurred, but I'm using now, my ego is now using certain aspects of the victim mentality to perpetuate a certain story. And what I was doing was when you are a victim and when you are traumatized, people leave you alone. People walk on eggshells. They tend to be very passive around you. They don't want to get you upset about anything. And I did like being left alone because when you are being left alone, you can deal with your own stuff or you can wallow in your own self-pity, which I was good at doing. So for me to change that mindset, it became instead of me saying I was a victim of childhood trauma, I say that I'm a survivor of childhood trauma. That change in terminology changes the story in my head and then also changes how I tell it to others. So I don't go around telling people that I'm a victim of childhood trauma. I talk about being a survivor of childhood trauma. I am a rape survivor. I am a survivor of being abandoned by my mother on the streets of Albuquerque, New Mexico with my little sister at the age of 11. I've survived these things. And because I've survived these things, I am stronger for it. And changing how we replay something in our head, changing the languaging that we use makes all the difference in whether or not something is repeated in our head that's negative or a lesson that we've learned. And we have the control, we have the ability to alter that perception. Uh, Next question, this goes actually right into it. Um, How can we be more positive? We have a choice in whether we are positive or negative. We have a choice whether we're going to be happy or unhappy. We have a choice each day in how we feel. Nobody comes along and says, you're going to be unhappy today. We choose to be unhappy or we choose not to be happy. We're not realizing that happiness is a choice that we can make. So we have a choice in how we perceive things. The egoic mind sees the negative because its goal is to protect us. Its job is to shield us from danger. And the ego will maintain control over our decision-making processes if we let it. But we have the choice. As long as we acknowledge the ego's concern, we can dismiss it and not react from a place of fear. And what I mean by that is uh, I talked about my childhood trauma. I was sexually assaulted by three Hispanic men And during that time afterwards, every time I saw Hispanic man, I got fearful, which is understandable. My ego is reminding me that Hispanic men have harmed me. And so it gets its hackles up. It's trying to let me know to leave or do something so I am not harmed again. However, over the course of my lifetime, keep in mind that happened once when I was 11. But over the course of my lifetime, I've worked with and befriended Hispanic men who are very kind and compassionate individuals. And I have more experiences in my lifetime of positive things with Hispanic men than I do with negative. So I can change my perception when a Hispanic man is walking towards me on the street and my ego says, woo, pay attention, danger could be approaching. I can remind my ego that I've only had one bad experience, I've had more positive, and I can dismiss that. And the fear will actually diminish the reaction that the body has when we are fearful, our shoulders go up, our ears start perking up and we start paying attention to things. All of that can be easily diminished. Does that make sense? Of course. So the other aspect of that that we need to understand is reacting from a fear-based place versus a loving, compassionate place occurs when we think we are in danger. But we need to understand that the ego cannot discern between real danger and imagined danger. So imagined danger are those things like when we watch a movie and there's a gang violence on there and we have Hispanic people and Chinese people or Oriental people you know, battling each other on the streets. And then when we start walking around town in our own lives, 
and we see Orientals and we see Hispanics, are they, you know, our hackles go up. Our ego doesn't differentiate between reality and TV in a movie. So when we feed our ego, lots of negativity and lots of fear-based images from social media or television or the movies, the news. When we feed our egos these things, our ego doesn't, cannot differentiate between what is real and what is imagined. So when we see the in real life, it's an automatic egoic response that we become fearful. And that's a lot of what we see in society today is an overreaction based on things that the media has shown us that we have been willing to watch when we look at our entertainment. Does that make sense? Always. All right. Next question. Uh, I know I was doing this as, especially as a younger. Um, why do I keep making the same mistakes over and over? That's so cute when you were younger. Making the same mistakes over and over and over is something that our, the universe does to allow us to learn a lesson that we must learn. And the universe will give us ample opportunities to relearn a specific teaching. So if we are making similar mistakes in different situations, we need to take a step back and see what the universe is trying to get us to learn. So maybe we need to learn to set personal boundaries so others don't hurt our feelings or take advantage of our compassionate nature. And personal boundaries are guidelines, rules, or limits that we can create that identify reasonable, safe, and permissible ways for people to behave towards us. It's also how we respond when some of those boundaries are stepped over and the consequences we impose to others for stepping over those boundaries. It's not being unkind to them for, step, for taking advantage of us. It's being loving towards ourselves. And this is a part of our self-care, a part of our self-love that we have to give ourselves when we set boundaries for others. So an example I can give about setting personal boundaries, my mother um, was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And she would call me drunk. And when she was drunk, she was very nasty and blamed me for everything that went wrong in her life. I was the reason my dad left her. I was the reason that she was an alcoholic. So she, and then she would just get very personal, nasty, calling me names and all kinds of things. So the personal boundary I set up with her was that if she called and she had been drinking or was high, that I would let her know that I could not talk to her in her state and that I would hang up on her. So if she called, I would say, mom, you're, you've are you been drinking. I can't talk to you this way. Call me when you're sober and I hang up on her. And over time, it did work. She did quit calling me when she had was in an altered state. It's hard at first to do that with people that you you know honor thy mother and father or that people that you love, your children who are harming themselves, you know, it's difficult to do that. But we have to be able to protect ourselves in order for us to eventually help others. And I, I never could help my mother. She had her own issues to deal with. But in setting boundaries and learning the lesson of how to set boundaries, then you end up taking control and you don't have to repeat that lesson with other people walking all over you over and over and over again because you are being kind and you are being generous and then have somebody take advantage of you. Learning how to set personal boundaries is one of the ways that we can learn to see the lessons that the universe is trying to give us. All right. This is all playing in together. Our last question of the day, how can we tell if someone is being authentic? To tell if someone's being authentic means that we ourselves have to be authentic. We have to be our true selves. There's no pretense. There's no mask. There's no disguises. There's no roles. We're not playing a role. We're just being. We're being who we really are. For us to know if others are being authentic, we must first be authentic with them. 
And that can be hard because that means we're being vulnerable. We're letting down our guard. We're letting people see our true emotions, our true feelings, who we truly are. So our bravery to show others our genuine selves encourages them and what we expect from them, that we expect them to be authentic with us because we're being authentic with them. But there are signs to look for in authentic people because authentic people know who they are and un are unapologetic for it. So they know they are worthy. They know they are enough. They're not making excuses about anything in their lives. They accept full responsibility for whatever is happening in their lives, whatever mistakes are happening in their lives. They accept and love themselves just as they are. And they will be willing to accept and love you just the way you are. They're not going to say, maybe you should try this or you should change and do that. They're going to accept you the way, they, way you are. If, however, you ask them their opinion or a question, they will be honest with you. And sometimes that's one of the things that... Um, supposedly I've had issues with is I, my husband calls it the sledgehammer of truth. And if you ask me a question, I can be brutally honest with that, but that's partly part of my personality. Over time, I've learned to wield that carefully. And in some instances, I am still very harsh, normally with children and close family relatives, but with the general public, I'm much calmer with that. So the other things that you can see with authentic people is that they are not after perfection, but they are always doing their best. They will strive to do better tomorrow than they did today. And whatever they failed at, they will look at, learn, take, learn the lesson that they were supposed to get from that experience and move on and try better tomorrow. They have a high emotional intelligence. And what do I mean by that? It means that they are easily going to show empathy and compassion for others. So when they see harm being done to somebody, they intervene because that's part of, of being who we truly are. We don't want to see others suffer. Um, they also know how to manage their fear because they are doing that breathing exercise. They are pausing. They are making sure that they are centered and are calm before they choose to respond to any given situation. They're optimistic and hopeful about the future because they know their future is manifesting into the dreams that they have or becoming part of their reality. They are genuinely expressing themselves and their feelings. So if they are um, going to show you love and appreciation, you're going to know that you're loved and appreciated because they're gen you can feel that from them. There's a genuine connection that you have with authentic people. And most importantly, they say they're sorry without being um, prompted to do so. So authentic people know when they have made a mistake. They know when they have slipped up, when they've misstepped, and they've potentially harmed somebody. And they will automatically apologize for that because they don't want any disconnection from you. They want that authentic connection, that authentic communication to occur. So being authentic with others allows them to be authentic with you. Does that make sense? Always. Any other questions? Not, not until next time. All right. Well, thank you, Joshua, for um, being with us all the way from Afghanistan. And you have a good evening. And thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have any further questions you'd like me to answer, please send them to terrykozlowski.com. And we can go ahead and get those into the next Q&A for the next Ask Terry session, hopefully in a couple weeks. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Soul Solutions with Terry Kozlowski. If you'd like the show and want to learn more, check out terrykozlowski.com where you can find the links to everything we talked about in this episode. Please subscribe to the show so you'll never miss an episode as we overcome our fears and our limiting beliefs. Thank you.